Hi, thank you, Eloise, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll just go straight into it. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to this panel. And um, if I can introduce our first speaker. Now, 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 just check, Richard, you have your camera on, but on my programme, it is Anna Schrutt, who is meant to be first. So I think you're, thank you, there you are, yes, hi. Um, so I think I'll, I'll introduce you one at a time, let you speak, and then introduce the next one. Um, I'll shout or wave or maybe clap or something at a point when you're about, you've got five minutes to go, if that helps. Shouting is fine because I don't think I'll be able to see the, the clap. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll just be rude and shout, cool. Okay, so um, so it's a delight to introduce to everyone here to, this afternoon, um, Anna Shrut, um Ramakrishnan um, Argwal, um, who's going to talk to us, uh, present a paper, Pluck to the Future, um, Andrew Bell and the Leg Legacy of Colonial Educationalists. Um, he's a second year doctoral student at looking at 19th and 20th century British educational and visual culture, the Department of Film Studies at the University of Aberdeen. Um, he's studying the use of film in educational contexts in Britain in the, Britain in the early cinematic period and has previously worked on the cartographic implications of films made by the British Colonial Film Unit um, and the cinematic defense of Hegel's idea of history in the work of a Senegalese filmmaker, uh, Jijibril uh, Diop Mambeti. Um, and he's previously got an MLit in film studies from St Andrew, Andrews and an MA in global cin cinemas um, as the transcultural from SOAS at the University of London. So it's a delight to welcome you here this afternoon and I shall hand straight over to you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. If, if I may just issue a brief clarification, it's not so much a defense of Hegel as much as uh, sort of an, an un, a, a critique of his, uh, uh, his idea of history, only given the, uh, the, the topic of this, uh, this conference. But thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm just about going to share my screen. I hope this is visible to everyone. Uh, yes, is that vis is that visible? If somebody could please give out a shout. Looks good. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, well, as it as um, as kind of the, today, it's called my paper is called Plaque to the Future. And it's about Andrew Bell or Reverend Dr. Andrew Bell who was a, well, an educational educationalist, um, was well known for founding the Madras system, and I'll kind of speak about that in a second. This paper is more about, um, it, it's not my main research area, but this paper is really more about tracing how colonial histories just get one, perpetuate a certain set of illusions, and how those illusions continue well into, into the 20th century and essentially into the 21st century via, a plaque. So very briefly, as mentioned, I look at film and educational life in Britain. Um, and I'll bring, come back to how that connects to what I'm going to talk about today a little later. But very quickly, this is, or rather to, to begin, what you see here is an image of the Blackfriars Chapel in front and the Madras College at the back. Uh, and I kind of came up across this image as part of a photography research project. And I wondered always whether there like whether Madras College had some link or some thematic link to, to the Blackfriars Chapel and therefore it was founded where it was. As it turns out, in a certain sense it does and in a certain sense it doesn't. Now, the Blackfriars Chapel was a domestic friary, uh, not a domestic friary, a Dominican friary, very sorry about that. And clearly as part of the Reformation, it was burned down, um, lives were lost and it's was really quite violent. But there's a way in which this history is written down. It's kind of in, in the plaque at the spot, it's kind of discussed and there is no um, there's no bad side, so to speak. On the other hand, when you look at Andrew Bell's plaque in front of Madras College, um, what you have is the mention of Madras, you have, which is of course in India, you have the monitorial system he started, but he's essentially an educator, reformer, and philanthropist. The history of how Andrew Bell was able to fund the university, the college, was is not quite mentioned really, and that's part of why we need to unpick the figure of what Andrew Bell was. He was born in St Andrews. He was um, 
he 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 was the son of a wake maker and barber he was apparently very very intelligent always had was very fond of scientific instruments and one of his first jobs was as a tutor for the children of Carter Braxton a virginian tobacco farmer uh, and he was tutoring his sons and Carter Braxton was also one of these people who signed the declaration of independence uh he paid a substantial salary to 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 bell and part of the salary was in bonds to into the tobacco business and braxton famously owned 165 slaves uh, in his tobacco plantation now there's also an apocryphal story but while the anti slavery mo- uh, movement was picking uh, picking pace in america uh, braxton apparently um, offered to buy the slaves of his anti slavery uh, a plantation owner so it's an, i don't know whether this is true or not but it's just a very interesting anecdote of somebody saying oh don't worry i'll rip, if you don't want slaves i'll rip them off you uh and that's the kind of figure braxton is uh andrew bell and this very little record of his time there uh in in the biographies of andrew bell as well the speed is just like his papers have been lost his reports have been lost uh bell subsequently came back to 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 scotland spent some time in england uh tutoring um was um with also the uh and holding various religious posts and eventually he moved to india to to essentially for a lucrative career where he went about um lecturing as part of different military regiments in the in the east india company he was um with the deputy cha- chaplain in a couple of places as well and eventually he was uh, he became in charge of the madras asylum uh, for the uh, for ch- for, ch- for children of soldiers of the of the east india company essentially illegitimate children often had with uh, women in the uh, in the country who nobody was willing to claim so in some sense andrew bell was really had a lot of compassion for them and wanted to make sure that they got the best education out of life and it is here that he comes up with what is called the madras system in madras where he gets senior students within the school within the school to um, i'm sorry did i was did somebody say something i think i might have, might have missed it that okay no but someone might not have might have their mic on and needs to turn it off i think we're getting some feedback okay uh, no problem thank you so much um sorry about the interruption so where he comes up with the madras asylum with the with the madras system which is senior students in the school teaching the junior students and um while he's running the, the asylum itself through some of his own money he's making a lot of money doing lectures for europeans across india and that's what leads to madras college and the plaque of madras in fact he paid for the building to be to be to be built in the spot and his money essentially working across the empire working for the east india company is what funds madras college uh, alongside the bonds that he had through carter braxton so he's this is how his money's been funded but it's it's clearly not mentioned as part of what um of as part of the plan now the thing about it is it's not mentioned as part of almost any subsequent history bell himself passed away in 1832 and while it's repeated as i will show you through a series of different instances of how um he you know the founder of the endowed of madras college what a great man um reformer and philanthropist you have like through more sort of popular forms of lecturing you have you quickly have here reverend dr andrew bell the founder and endowed of madras college and it's part of other larger histories of st andrews a little later the the sort of the trust through andrew bell funds the educational chairs in um in both st andrews and in edinburgh and philosophers such as one of one of the one of the more f- famous scottish philosophers um especially of the late 19th early 20th century ss lorry um was fu- his educational chair was funded through um the trust and then there are these biographies written uh, later in the 19th century in 1881 uh meek uh dr dr m say um, md meekel john writes a biography of dr andrew bell which is again very effusive about the remarkable work he did in he did in india and how he tried his best to educate carter braxton's children even though they were not terribly bright um uh, and how uh, and how he used his money to fund these um fund things such as uh, madras college and when he tried to set up something similar one of the instances there mentioned is when he tried to set something similar up 
in the West Indies through one of his protégés, a protégé uh, just decided he wasn't interested in education. And the local plantation owners did not want um, did not want their slaves to be educated under the system. But the role of, of how Bell himself gets the money is not mentioned here. Uh, and this actually continues into the early 20th century. So again, there's 100 years of Madras College, you have a newspaper article which says a remarkable career and talks about how Dr. Bell devised the Madras system um, of, you know, and again, it's about his funding it, but there's no more information about his life, about any of the connections of either of slavery and or of colonialism. And, and yes, this also means that these narratives were embedded into what, uh, into the life of Britain during this period. But it also means that these things repeatedly get elided and continue to do so, like the plaque that we saw, which still exists in cont contemporary times. Um, of interest here are also two um, rectors of, um, of, of Madras College who at different points gave, gave lectures about the history of the college or Andrew Bell's history. And again, both of them tend to repeat the same bits of information and they, uh, they tend to uh, quote um, Michael John in particular as a source of um, on, on Andrew Bell. Uh, I was particularly uh, taken by John Thompson's um, his brief history of Andrew Bell's life, where there's a lot of mentions of busts of Andrew Bell, portraits of Andrew Bell, and how his students want printed a hundred little posters of Andrew Bell. So the idea of the image being perpetuated is both written into some of these accounts, but also is done through these accounts. The last one of these you will realize is, is 1997. So it's over 150 years, the same facts about Andrew Bell keep getting repeated. And that leads to a plaque. Five minutes, by the way. Okay, and that leads to a plaque that you have as it, it is today. And at this stage, I'd like to read the plaque. So Andrew Bell is an educational reformer and a philanthropist. He was born in St. Andrews. It was while serving in Madras in India. Absolutely no mention of colonialism that he developed a form of schooling where the older pupils taught the younger pupils. He returned um, he, he, he returned and introduced his Madras or monitorial system as an economical form of mass education. The idea of spread of Madras schools appearing in Canada and Australia among among his other local benefactions was the Bell Fund for the benefit of St. Andrews. He ended his career in the uh, prebendary of Westminster Abbey where he is buried. So very storied career but perhaps also keeping, given sort of greater discourses around um, slavery, there's absolutely no mention of his connection to, to Virginia. His life seems to start here with uh, the Madras system. So there is some, this may potentially an active knowledge of what's being elided. And this is this is the thing about histories being elided. This, it's very difficult to some, sometimes trace them through, but that's what at least I'm finding interesting about this project um, is to think about repeatedly what is missed. And I want to draw a comparison here with why educational figures and education itself is important when thinking about these elisions. So this is where some of my film work comes in. Uh, so this is a newspaper article about Dali Dale Sunday School Award distrib Prize Distribution Ceremony, uh, where I know it's not terribly clear, but the lower half talks about how um, in, uh, films were shown um, about the Boer War and God Save the Queen was sung, Rural Britannia was sung, Soldiers of the Queen was sung. So a prize distribution ceremony at a school became a way of creating pride in the empire, creating pride in Britain. And similarly speaking about a figure without thinking about their legacies or without thinking about the more complicated politics of their of their lives in education creates this, this idea of what they did was education, is knowledge. Um, and another example from film, this is a film catalog from uh, 1903, which describes uh, the trip of a missionary to India and a film that he recorded. Uh, it talks about the degradation the Indians were in and how the Christian influence leads to a healing. Um, I give these two examples of a Sunday school and a religious or a missionary film precisely because Andrew Bell was very keen about the Church of England. England um, religious instruction and he wanted the Madras system to continue to perpetuate that. But the idea here of one religion mixing with education of colonial narratives, essentially the ideas of superiority mixing with education. And in Bell's case, this is continuing through his 
the legacy, the legacy for how he used his money without acknowledging of how he made his money um, is also seen in, in, in essentially what becomes um, image practices of early 20th century. And that's why if you think about things such as the Edward Goldstone statue being taken out, it's really, in some way, it's difficult to explain to some, somebody who's not in favor of it, why exactly a statue is being removed of a philanthropist, because often these roots of these money, they're difficult to trace in popular histories. Obviously, in more, in more um, academic histories, they are possible, but in more popular history, that's difficult to trace them. Um, and, that's, and at this point, I'd like to come back to the plaque and the friary plaque, where in one sense, you, there's an acknowledgement of a much older history and the fact that there was conflict, but that both the Catholics and, uh, and the Protestants are part of the Scottish heritage. So there's no uh, blame assigned. There's no kind of, it's, it's not that the violence is hidden in one case, where in another case, a lot of that violence in a plaque today continues to be elided. Um, and in some form, through the idea of Madras College and through the idea of Andrew Bell, these histories continue. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, and thank you for keeping so well to time. Um, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, and I think what I, I will do is hold off and I will move straight on and invite Richard up next, but I, I'm sure we'll come back to questions at the end. That, that, so our next speaker um, is uh, hopefully, he's appearing while I quickly read the bio, is uh, my colleague Richard Anderson from the University of Aberdeen. Um, he's a lecturer in slavery at the University of Aberdeen. He's going to talk to us about the University of Aberdeen and the legacies of slavery in, uh, in the northeast of Scotland. Um, he's a historian of Africa and the African diaspora with a particular emphasis on abolitionism and colonialism in West Africa and the Atlantic world. Uh, he's the author of um, Abolition in Sierra Leone, Rebuilding Lives and Identities in 19th Century West Africa, um, and also co-editor of Liberated Africans and the Abolition of the Slave Trade. And he's published articles in journals like Slavery and Abolition, History in Africa, African Economic History, and soon the English Historical Review. Um, before joining us here in Aberdeen, he's travelled the entire length of the island, um, from the University of Exeter's um, Cornwall campus, where he was a lecturer in colonial and post-colonial history. And so without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Richard. Right. Andrew, thank you for that introduction. And hopefully, uh, if I have this right, you can uh, see my PowerPoint and me as well. Is that the case? We can see, uh, yes. Okay, perfect. So, um, to begin by thanking, of course, Eloise, Desha, and Matthew for the invitation to speak today and to share uh, work that the University of Aberdeen is currently undertaking as part of a two-year research project examining the legacy of historic slavery to the university within the context of the broader city and region. So part of this study is to explore and contextualize the financial legacy of slavery to the university and produce a financial report on endowments which the university has received that can be traced to wealth resulting from historic slavery. So in my talk today, I'd like to discuss some of the work done thus far and some of the goals for the project. And I'm going to structure the talk around first looking at some models and contexts of university studying historical connections to slavery. Second, looking at definitions of what constitutes a link to slavery um, historically and geographically. Next, the different forms of historical links between the university and slavery that have come to light through benefactors, alumni, faculty, and through material connections such as the built environment. And finally, is to consider how to best acknowledge this history within the city and shire. So there are several universities that have undertaken or are undertaking institutional studies uh, of financial legacies of historic slavery. Those of us in Scotland are probably most familiar with a landmark 2018 study by Dr. Stephen Mullen and Professor Simon Newman at the University of Glasgow, which estimated that in present day terms, the university benefited between 17 and 200 million pounds from historic slavery. And so several universities have published or are in the process of uh, publishing similar reports, including Jesus College Cambridge in the UK, Brown University and the College of William and Mary in the United States, uh, Dalhousie University and the University of King's College, both uh, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada, 
Uh, and there's also a consortium led by the University of Virginia called University Studying Slavery, which now has 80 member institutions and looks at best practices for truth telling projects addressing human bondage and racism in institutional histories. And over the past year in particular, we've seen a proliferation of academic positions um, and temporary posts to undertake these institutional histories of universities and the legacies of slavery and empire. And I think it is important to acknowledge that this groundswell of self scrutiny on the part of universities is to a large extent the result of black activism in the 13 months since the murder of George Floyd. So a study of historical linkages and financial legacies of slavery requires a definition of what constitutes a linkage to historical slavery. And organizations such as the National Trust and English Heritage have undertaken their own surveys and with Madge Dresser and Miranda Kaufman, both historians along with English Heritage and University College London, have developed a six point criteria for establishing particularly individuals connections to historic slavery, which I've listed here, which can enrage. Your yes. slides have vanished. Your slides have vanished. Oh. Just okay. sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, that's all right. Let me see what I can do. Is that better? Yeah, they don't seem to be moving forward for us all, though. Oh, hang on. Hmm. Oh, I seem to be able to move them. So which slide do you want people to see? If you just tell me change slide, I'll do it for you. That'll be slide four linkages. There we are. OK. Oh, everyone else can move them. OK. Uh, yeah, I please just let me move them, people. <laughs> OK. Um, so as you can see here, just keep on time. There are um, criteria of what constitutes Linkages to slavery, whether this is through direct investment in slave ships, insuring them, um, purchasing shares in the Royal African Company, South Sea Company, the provision of trade goods, for example, to plantations or dealing in slave produced goods, of course, owning and obtaining uh, plantations, holding colonial office, being otherwise involved in slave colonies, and of course, the employment, quote unquote, of enslaved people. Uh, so Aberdeen's financial report is going to adopt this criteria, but also consider less explicit connections. Um, <laughs> OK, <laughs> I apologize for the uh, the issues here. Um, and so then when thinking about linkages to slavery, it's important to consider also what we mean by historic slavery geographically and temporally. Uh, most comparable institutional st studies have implicitly or Im explicitly taken historic slavery to pertain to the racialized chattel slavery of the Americas and to the transatlantic slave trade from Africa to the Americas. The slides have gone now, slides Richard, now. sorry. <laughs> hmm. Let me see what I can do here. Has that worked? That's worked, yes. OK, I apologize for that again. Don't worry. Um, so to consider that, of course, we're looking primarily at the connections be uh, between Northeast Scotland and the Caribbean in, in the centuries leading up to the 1834 Abolition Act, but to consider also that these connections with slavery go far beyond 1830s uh, and also in the study considering different forms of indenture and apprenticeship during the post-emancipation period. Um, and a final consideration, of course, is that we're looking at the historical linkages with not one institution, but the University of Aberdeen's two predecessor institutions, King's College founded in 1495 and Marshall College founded in 1593, which combined in 1860 to form the modern University of Aberdeen. So we're now 10 months into a 20 more four month project and it's possible to provide an overview of some of the research findings just thus far. Research began with a small scale study to identify live financial endowments derived from historic slavery. That is the cash remaining cash value remaining as of 2019. 
and looking at endowments made before 1900, it suggested that the university retains live endowments worth at least 305,000 that are known or suspected to be linked to historic slave trading or plantations in the West Indies. Until this initial study only considered cash value currently as live endowments and didn't consider the original value of endowments, much of which has now been spent, and the value of those endowments by present day value and the various forms of inflation calculations that this involves. Um, but a few individual examples illustrate some of these connections uh, between financial legacies of slavery and the university. So John Henderson left his alma mater, Marsha College, 500 pounds, while at the same time left an annuity of 50 pounds to Thomas, who he described as his black servant. Gilbert Ramsey, who Sheehan Loftus will be speaking on tomorrow, is probably the university benefactor whose involvement with chattel slavery is best known. Ramsey spent four decades in Barbados and grew wealthy enough to leave behind a substantial bequest totaling 5,540 pounds to charitable causes, including 3,800 pounds to Marshall College, his alma mater. This was paid for partly through the sale of an unknown number of enslaved people. John Gray, you can also think about faculty who taught mathematics at Marshall College and from 1764 until his death was rector of the college. This was a largely ceremonial position as at this time he lived in Richmond Hill near London. Gray was also the owner of Gray's Inn Castle Plantation in St. George Parish, Jamaica, and at his death he bequeathed some 2,000 acres and the enslaved people on that land to his nephews. He also uh, left Marshall 1,000 pounds in 1768 to fund two mathematical bursaries. Um, this fund was later conjoined with the Fullerton, Moyer and Gray Fund, uh, which continues to support postgraduate scholarships today. So many alumni, faculty and affiliates of both Kings and Marshall made a career within Britain's slave empire, even if they did not donate to their alma maters. Um, and we're on the, the screen here that says alumni and faculty, I'm hoping. You are. OK, great, thank you. Um, and so one of John Gray's successors as rector of Marshall was Alexander Allardyce of Dunatar, who made his fortune as a slave factor in Kingston, Jamaica. That is purchasing enslaved Africans from incoming slave vessels and selling them onto plantations on the island. So returning to Aberdeen in 1780, he became an MP for Aberdeen. Uh, as well as holding the post of rector at Marshall until his death. And you can see in the top right, an 1808 biographical index of members of parliament described Gray simply as having sold about as many black men as there are white in his native city, Aberdeen, where he returned with a large fortune. And Sir Alexander Grant of Dalvey studied a rudimentary correspondence course in pharmacy at Aberdeen before embarking for Jamaica. And over his lifetime, he obtained six estates, which totaled his death almost 7,000 acres and which held 4, 000, uh, 457 enslaved people in captivity. Grant was also the co-founder of Grant Oswald & Co, who purchased the Bunce Island Slave Trading Fortress in the Sierra Leone estuary. And in the bottom right, you can see Grant's coat of arms depicting a Highlander and an African, which shows how some alumni of the era were not shy to flaunt the source of their wealth. And alongside examining the, the financial legacy of slavery to the university and document these connections to donors, alumni and faculty is to consider the material connections and physical legacy which link campus to the Caribbean. So those of you who studied, worked or researched at Aberdeen are likely familiar with the most tangible link between the university and slavery derived wealth. That is Powys Gate or Gateway uh, located on college bounds at the heart of the city of uh, the university's King's College campus. The gates once served as the entrance to Powys House. It left a 19th century mansion in North Aberdeen, which has been a community center since 1941. So some of these connections are known, but we're undertaking research to fully explore the connections with this gate and the history of Jamaica. So the entrance to what was once the Leslie family was paid for in part with money received by the family as compensation for the loss of 94 formerly enslaved men, women and children at Castile Fort Penn in the former parish of Port Royal, Jamaica, just outside of Kingston, 
seen on this map. So at the time of emancipation, the British government compensated the Leslie family 2,021 pounds. That can be more than 200,000 pounds today for the loss of their enslaved property. The compensation funds were granted to Agnes Ann Leslie, the widow of the absentee owner, John Leslie, uh, you Leslie rather, and their oldest son, John Leslie, used a substantial portion of this compensation money to commission the gateway. The family also donated to the nearby St. Macker's Cathedral in Old Aberdeen and are commemorated with the stained glass window installed in 1913. And although the university at Powers Gateway's particular link to slavery has been given more public attention lately, it is not likely that all students and staff who walk past Powers Gate know about its provenance. And so the university is currently in discussions with the community, including the old Aberdeen Heritage Society uh, and the old Aberdeen Community Council to explore how best to contextualize the history of Powers Gate and more properly memorialize those who paid for its construction with their unpaid labor in Jamaica. And so most of what I presented today has focused on the history of men in particular born in Northeast Scotland who were linked to Atlantic slavery and the University of Aberdeen's predecessor institutions. In other words, I've largely focused on perpetrators and beneficiaries. This focus on beneficiaries of enslavement is inherent to this type of institutional study on the legacies of slavery derived wealth within Scotland. But it's also imperative that our research focus not just on Scots abroad, but to reconstruct as far as possible the experiences of enslaved people of African descent whose unpaid labor produced the wealth that the study seeks to trace. So, for example, in researching the history of Powers Gateway. Richard, yep. you have about a minute left. OK, thank you very much. So in researching the history of Powers Gateway, we've looked in particular at what we can uncover about the lives of the 94 men, women and children that the Leslie family claimed compensation for. Um, and those of you who have uh, been able to visit the campus lately have hopefully seen uh, a temporary art exhibition um, by uh, local ceramic artist Helen Love and a poem by spoken word artist Noon Abdel Razig. Um, and the ceramic panel presents an image of an imagined portrait of an enslaved woman whose artists who have named Kwashiba. Kwashiba was one of 94 people who were on uh, Castile Fort Penn at the time of emancipation and whose labor helped pay for the construction of palace gates. And so as we consider the history of university benefaction and alumni such as Gilbert Ramsey, it is important to recognize and reconstruct the histories of women like Kwasheba whose lives link the history of Northeast Scotland with Africa and the Caribbean. I'll leave it there. Well, thank you, Richard. Um, so I will move straight through to our last speaker who, uh, while I'm quickly introducing, hopefully will turn on camera and bring up slides. So I'd like to welcome uh, Thomas uh, Archambault uh, of the University of Glasgow, uh, who is going to speak to us about Sir John McPherson and King's College Aberdeen, um, Highland Patronage, Aberdeen Enlightenment and Bengal. Now, Thomas is an AHRC SGSH SAH funded PhD student in Scottish history at Glasgow and his interests are in the Scottish Highlands in India in the long 18th century uh, encompassing uh, the Scottish Enlightenment and Clan Macpherson. So um, welcome to at least uh, in sort of virtually to Aberdeen uh, Thomas and you have the floor. Thank you, thanks very much. Um, can maybe can you see my slides? Uh... We can't, I'm afraid. OK, um, just see what I could do. Um, sorry for that. Still. OK. Can you hear me at least? 
We, we can hear you. There's a bit of a lag. It looks like the slides. Oh, something's happening. Yeah, okay. we've got your slides now. Cool. That's perfect. Uh, that's perfect. So probably time to <laughs> time to start. So thanks for the presentation. Um, so in March 1798, the former Governor General uh, of Bengal, Sir John Macpherson, received a letter from his friend Roderick MacLeod, uh, some principal of King's College, Aberdeen. He asked Macpherson for details on his Scottish ancestry before passing uh, them on to uh, William Bentham, the author of the monumental baronetage of England. So John Macpherson, uh, the man you can see on the picture, like MacLeod, was a native of the Western Isles of Scotland. He was born on Skye, but educated at Kicks College, Aberdeen, before going to India. His career was quite successful, but tarnished by a suspicion of corruption. He succeeded Warren Hastings as Governor General of Bengal in 1785, but had to resign because of interferences with Mongol princes and the East India Company. Macpherson's remains quite a neglected figure of British imperial and political history, despite his lifelong association with his kinsman James Macpherson, you can see on the right, creator of the poems of Ocean, who worked as a political writer and an agent for the Mongols. John and James both studied in Aberdeen, but in contrast with Sir John, previous historiography has a lot to say on the links between James Macpherson and his alma mater, but less on John Macpherson and Aberdeen. The role of Aberdeen in the forging of the Macpherson's political culture and networks have been significantly overlooked. The tendency was to minor or even ignore the importance of Aberdeen to the only advantage of the capital city, Edinburgh, seen as the prestigious educational place with strong connections to continental Europe. However, Aberdeen represented for John Macpherson a crucial backstory for his colonial career providing him with useful networks and connections with the whole of Scotland. In terms of Highland patronage in India, as well as imperial thinking, Aberdeen was central and appealed to students from the local Highland gentry. So rather than focusing today on the details of John's education, my paper will reevaluate the nature of his connections with Aberdeen, and especially King's College, through the prism of his later activities in India. So Macpherson's connections were manifest in two ways. On the one hand, Aberdeen College is functioning as seminaries for the empire, exporting human capital to India. On the other hand, King's College was also a natural place for the promotion of Gallic speaking students from the Highlands. John Macpherson's experience as a student at King's was quite typical. He was born in a family of Presbyterian ministers with strong Hanoverian sympathies. He studied divinity and even graduated in 1764. His studies were funded by the Synod of Glenelg on the express condition that grantees will enter the Presbyterian ministry. As John did not follow the steps of his father, he was later asked by the Synod to reimburse the loan composed of the grant plus the interest. Such sponsorship was particularly common and explained the remarkable influx of students from the Western Isles to Aberdeen University in the 18th century. It was also part of the SSPCK, the Scottish Society for the Promotion of Christian Knowledge. It was explaining so the SSPCK's active attitude towards the West and East of Scotland, where the Catholic presence was not neg negligible. Despite some hostility toward the native tongue, the SSPCK's Gaelic speaking uh, relations, sorry, to Gaelic speaking congregation was particularly pragmatic. So this open minded stretch. It was clear. It's probably time to introduce you to the main representant of the strong Highland network in King's College, um, Roderick MacLeod. You can see uh, on the right, with um, there's a yellow, um, a yellow star. When John entered King's College, MacLeod had been regent for nearly 20 years. He and his established relevant channels to offer places to students from the Highlands. This is why John Kay, in this wonderful uh, sketch depicting eight prominent figures from King's College, who presented MacLeod wearing a Highland dress with the comment, um, here, here it is, annually for 45 years and upwards have I beat up even to the Ilta Matula of a recruited or university. So both from Hebrides and sons of Presbyterian ministers, 
MacLeod and MacPherson were from a very similar origin and geography. They shared similar preoccupation. In the letter addressed to MacLeod that I mentioned in my introduction, MacPherson responded to his friend's curiosity and showed his excellent knowledge of the history of the Isle of Skye. But MacPherson's connection to King's College did not end with his departure to Edinburgh in 1764. The necessity to keep an eye on patronage networks explains why he was keen on maintaining strong ties of the institution. On the one hand, um, the, the strategy takes place on an informal and official levels alike. So on the one hand, recommendation of Aberdeen alumni pervade letters sent by Roderick MacLeod to John in Calcutta and then in London. On the other hand, Macpherson served as rector of King's College between 17, 1785 and 1797 offering him a foothold in the official administration. Yeah. So his involvement in King's College could only be understood in the context of the changing politics on the imperial theatre. John Macpherson's association with Kings was motivated by colonial preoccupation and especially with the finance of a Mongol governor, Mohammed Ali Khan Velaya. You can see his face uh, here. Access to the Durbar, the court of the um, Mongol governor, provided Macpherson with numerous gifts and objects. In 1779, for example, he gifted three manuscripts, probably of Persian origin, to the library. This was also facilitated by the money derived from John's involvement in the business of the Arcot, Arcot state. Situated in Bengal in the southeast of India, the Arcot state was the 45th, cap the 45th capital of the Muslim Nawabs and the scene of numerous trade, conflicts and contacts between the Mughals, the British and the French. In this part, the British had an ally in the person of Mohammed Ali Khan in order to come to balance the influence of France. I will just be brief here, I just want to emphasize how this technical and quite incredibly uh, complex issue connects to Kings through John's participation. So in order to increase the Narab's revenue and the company's cash, a system of taxation of land was created, but this was not enough. So the Nawab rapidly borrowed heavily from company servants, including John McPherson himself. So with the full disapprobation of London and the court of directors, the Nawab acquired a stronger importance in the politics of the company. So what's the connection with Kings? When McPherson left India after a short and controversial career, he left the sum of £18,000 in the Carnatic stuck. After his death, he left a bursary bearing his name to Kings for the benefit of a student from the Highlands in the Curriculum of Arts in King's College. The University Senate thought that the initial annual bequest, £80, 80 pounds per annum, was, I quote, a sum too large in proportion to the expense of living and of education in Aberdeen. So they modified his plan which aimed at helping as many Highland students as possible every year, rather than allocating money for one student over four years. It's also interesting to notice that um, the, his generosity was not limited to Aberdeen, but also extended to Edinburgh University. As a keen Gaelic speaker himself, John also promoted the preservation of the language as a cultural asset and a marker of origin. Given the recess of Gaelic in, in most areas, I will probably suggest that the word Gaelic should be taken not as a restrictive term, but, design, but designed to help students from the Highlands to go to, to go to King's College. What makes Gaelic particularly essential to, in Macpherson's eyes remains a crucial que question and co could only be apprehended for its imperial purposes. In Bengal, Gaelic was used as a cultural and social marker by Highlanders for the purposes of patronage and promotion within the East India Company or the British Army. In terms of educational opportunities, Gallic distinctiveness was particularly instrumental in the promotion of Highland students at the time when the poems of Ocean, created by his kinsman, James Macpherson, shaped the military culture of the Highland soldier in Britain and the Empire. So to wrap it up, three very short conclusive remarks, probably a need to reposition Aberdeen and King's College as a natural place for exporting human capital to the Imperial Theatre. Uh, this might explain why King's College 
uh, provided Macpherson with relation throughout his long professional life. Finally, Gallic. From what I've been able, the Gallic enthusiasm of John was more about supporting students from the Isle of Skye, but also from the Highlands. So from the from the Galtac, it was more this than actual Gallic teaching. This raises important questions on the practice of Gallic among uh, Aberdeen students, and also how this linguistic deafness was transposed to the British Empire as a sign of confidence, a performative sense of identity in which King's College probably played its part. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Thomas, um, and thank you to all our speakers. And um, that was absolutely fascinating. And thank you for again to all speakers for keeping so well to time. I think if I could invite all the speakers back, because we do now have uh, 10 minutes for questions and discussions. I believe the protocol here is for people to drop questions or at least indicate their desire to ask a question in the chat. And I will not exercise um, chair's privilege, but invite Jim Tomlinson to um, pose his question straight away. Right, so this is a question actually partly arising from the chat where it's been suggested, I think by Michael Morris, that uh, Dundee University is going to follow other universities uh, in looking at the links to slavery. And that raised the question for me about your kind of typology of, of linkages and, and how we think about those, because in the case of, uh, of Dundee, um, the, the uh, major uh, money from the, for the foundation of the university came from the Baxter family, the great uh, jute and, and, and linen firm in the city. Now, as far as we know, there are no direct links with slavery, although it has been suggested that the earlier generations possibly had some. Um, but uh, what we do know about the Baxter uh, company uh, was that they made a huge amount of money by selling uh, linen and jute goods to uh, clothed slaves. Uh, so does one regard that as within the kind of remit of the kind of connections which are deemed relevant to what you're doing? Because that that is not a, not in the usual way in which one considers a direct beneficiary of slavery. But without those slave markets, both in the Caribbean and in the southern United States, those that company, for example, and, and it would apply to other companies as well, would not have, have grown in the way in which it did. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I mean, that's why I think it's important to bring up that sort of typology and consider these questions where seemingly this is an obvious question of what constitutes a linkage to slavery. Um, and then it becomes less so when you look at it. And it can range from, say, institutions, universities in the United States like Georgetown and Baylor that owned enslaved people um, to connections that are less obvious. And of course, an individual where we say, well, their wealth derived in part from slavery. So how do we account for that? And I think that's why these regional perspectives are important. So in the case of Aberdeen, it's related to our, our location, but also the fact that these two colleges span the entire history of the British Empire. And so with Dundee, you're looking at um, a sort of similar location uh, within the UK, but at the same time, it's a much later institution and, and these sort of linkages are very much related to families and, and how that relates to the Atlantic and beyond. But I think it's certainly that would, I think, reach that criteria and really for the sake of time, I didn't really have a chance to tease out some of those less explicit connections. Okay, thank you, Richard. So I have three questions lined up. So uh, Alison, May and Ralph. So Alison, do you want to turn your mic on and ask your question or would you like me just to sort of kind of convey it? Uh, <clears throat> can you hear me? Absolutely, yes. Um, yes, I, I was just really interested in the um, Gaelic language that you were talking about because I'm aware that um, a lot of the traders in the Southeast Caribbean were all native Gaelic speakers, and I'm sure it must have played a part. Um, but, I, but, you know, because n nothing was written in Gaelic, th there's no records that I can find of that. And I, I wondered if you had references that might uh, help inform what I'm thinking about. 
So oh, sorry, Thomas. that was for to uh, that was for Thomas. Hey, I think he's there. Thomas, did you catch that? I think your microphone's off, Thomas. Oh yes. Uh, still off. I wonder if we've lost Thomas and what I might suggest is that we move to May. Can I suggest we move to your question and then if Thomas's mic gets going, he can then give his answer to Alison's question when we kind of reestablish the connection. So uh, May, would you like to ask your question, please? Yeah, thanks. Um, I just want to say thank you to all the speakers. Um, it's been so interesting so far, so I really appreciate everything you have to say. Um, I guess this is more to you, Richard. Um, uh, obviously, all these conversations that we're having now about the historical colonial connections of the, of the university's wealth, you know, they're happening a few centuries after the fact, but they are happening today and it's very important. I wonder if they're happening alongside current conversations about divestment. Um, you know, the university has the um, their sustainability policy, which has changed slightly. So the wording, some might say, you know, there's there's a bit of a loop, loophole. You're maybe not directly investing in arms, but, you know, there's other things you might be investing in. So I'm just wondering if those conversations are happening and if they're happening informed by these conversations that are important, but I guess they're ultimately not kind of affecting the, the present um, present political climate. Yeah, thank you. I think not probably perhaps as much as you might expect. And I think sometimes these conversations go alongside between increasing diversity and representation within the university and faculty in particular, alongside initiatives like decolonizing the curriculum, perhaps less so of a sort of critical appraisal of, of the origins of, of past wealth uh, and, and relating that to the present. Um, and perhaps an exception is to note that in, in many ways, you know, the students are often the ones who lead these discussions. And I think in times where you see institutions that, that take some of these questions seriously, in some ways it's the institution and, and the faculty catching up with that. Um, so I think that's important to note, but perhaps not as much as you might expect. And, and yeah. Thank you, um, Richard. So I think now um, Ralph, I've got Ralph O'Connor and then um, Wendy has her hand up. So I, I will put her next in the list and then I will put myself in the list if I may. Um, so Ralph, would you do you want to ask your question? Yeah, thanks. This is, uh, this is if I don't get if I don't get the boys um, taking um, this point in the afternoon. Thanks very much for the three really interesting papers. I'm just got a question which applies to a number of papers that have gone already, not just Richard's, um, about how we think about present day equivalents to the sums that we're talking about. In, you know, and Richard, you mentioned the Paris Gate Gateway and, and how much did that cost and then what the present day equivalent was. And I know that there are a number of different ways of calculating that kind of thing, but often I mean, that side of things translating into present day money is really important for the kind of public outreach side of this type of conversation, feeding into some of the things Jennifer was saying earlier. And I wonder, is, has there been, in, in the context of these kind of reopening um, links to slavery, has there been a renewed and really focused kind of robust re-examination of the mechanisms which we use to translate spend in from 18th century or 19th century from whichever social class into present day terms? I, because of having looked at this through a completely different perspective in 19th century cultural history, I know that it all depends on how you deal with different tax regimes and how much certain staples cost and that kind of thing. But has there been some kind of examination of that in the context of translating sums of money into present day sums, especially given that you know reparations are also part of the conversation? So this is, this is a question. A question Ralph, Richard, I think I think you've got your question. Just I'm conscious of time, so I think Richard yeah. to, gets the gist and can answer. Yeah, I, th I think the key point is that I'm I'm not an expert, and I think in engaging with this, you become an expert. So I come at this report as a uh, historian of slavery and of Africa, um, but of course, when you look at this, where it is that range of ambiguity. So of course, it's it's 
donate. It's looking at the, fine, the the historical record as much as possible. And then seeing that if we look at the Glasgow study, it's an incredible range, 17 million to 200 million pounds. And that is just based upon these permutations. And so in some ways, you know, the best we can do is is lay that all out. This is the evidence that's before us. And we look at these through different forms of inflation, a sort of subjective element of saying, well, how much of somebody's wealth or a family's wealth is connected to this history? Um, and I think just, but as far as I know, um, others will know better than I do. And hopefully they'll be in touch about if we can calculate this over time with any more precision. Thank you, Richard. Um, so I think Wendy, you have your hand up. Yes, um, I was. I have a question for Thomas. Can he hear? Uh, Thomas, can you hear us now? Uh, can you? You're you're still muted. Can you? Oh. Oh. No, he's not able to hear. No, but it looks. Okay. Uh, maybe I can suggest if you ask your question, it, we okay. will give him one more try to answer that one and Alison's. But if not, at least he has a chance to answer. Maybe maybe you could contact him by email or in some other way afterwards. So but at okay. least it might be interesting for us all to hear the question. So go ahead and we'll hope it works. OK, this is a question of clarification. Um, he said um, something about exporting human capital to India. And I was wondering when he says human capital, is he talking about black enslaved labor or is he talking about other like who who is this um, human capital? OK, so uh, Thomas, we'll give you a second. Uh -huh. OK, no, I think uh, Matthew's made a very sensible suggestion and I'm hoping Thomas can hear us that maybe you Thomas I suggest you could maybe respond to Alison and Wendy's questions uh, he's just fallen out of the meeting so uh, in the chat I mean if I if I may um, oh hello sorry I'll no. mute my yeah <laughs> Yeah, um, so there's a lot going on. I, I have a just a, a quick question. I know we've got about a minute to go, so maybe I'm not sure if it's a question or an observation, but it, it was something that struck me actually listening um, to Anushrut's paper, but also Richard's and indeed Thomas's, is the question, you know, we, we've got a conference here that's, again, picking up on Mackie's theme about the kind of regional connections to colonialism and empire. And I think there's, a, and there, there are questions. And, and I think one, one thing I was thinking about listening to them is that a lot of the kinds of connections, whether it's around plaques and commemoration, whether it's around sort of universities and finances, or indeed, um, kind of get the Gallic language. These are shared by other regions, and I think there's a real question here about how far, how far are we charting some sort of a, sort of a unique set of connections in the northeast of Scotland? How far are we charting? Uh, sort of a set of connections which are actually much more general but happen to be shared in the northeast of Scotland. So there's a question about distinctiveness and typicality and where the balance lies. Um, and that's sort of an observation, but maybe I'll invite, our, if I could, our speakers to reflect on it. And uh, I think maybe if we have one, I think Richard's done a lot of work. So Anushrut, would you be happy to reflect on that as a final kind of uh, before we go for tea? Oh, yeah. Yep, great. No, thank you so much for this. Also, my apologies. I heard the word defense instead of defiance in your introduction, and therefore my correction. Uh, no, no, that was yeah. absolutely fine. I, I was skim yeah. reading while trying to flip into Teams, and it just, my, my eye just skipped over the word wrong. So I totally apologize. It, it's yeah, an no, important no, correction uh, to make. I totally no, understand. Um, and apologies from my end as well there. Um, I, I don't think, um, I'm, I'm sure there are similar histories in other parts of Britain, as there is of Andrew Bell. Um, I think it's sort of very much a local context, which kind of living in St. Andrews is, is available to me. And it's kind of interesting to think about the histories. Often, I find it interesting to think about the histories locally rather than say, okay, you know, there are so many people who, who have a similar thing, but even I think untangling one web was trying to see how one history, mm. one person moves through contexts, um, I think allows for similar uh, connections to be made elsewhere. Mm. I, as I said, it's also, I think for me, the fact that he's an educationalist, you know, and yes, there are other philanthropists, there are many others, and I'm sure there are other educationalists in other, part of the, other parts of Britain and indeed the world. But I think clearly the idea of somebody teaching and the idea of somebody who's who's got an interesting legacy because he took on orphans of the empire. So there's, there's clearly some good in there and some great compassion in there. Uh, 
also highlights that this is a complex thing. You can't you can't just suddenly now take down a statue or a plaque of Andrew Bell and that doesn't solve the problem. Uh, I mean, he's he's so you've got to acknowledge the compassion, but also say that actually the work was the work of educating Britain was funded by um, and Br Britain's orphans was funded by the colonies and there's a direct sense in which that happens. Um, so that's what I find interesting about Bell, but I'm sure there are similar, at least in my case, there are similar histories elsewhere. Thank you, a fascinating answer. Now, I, I, I think, uh, Lass, uh, we must draw this session to a close. So I would like, if I could ask everyone to join me in thanking all our speakers, I believe you can even give an E round of applause. I'll give one, a proper one. So thank you all. And I think we have, I, maybe if Eloise, um, or Desha or Matthew could let everyone know when they need to be back. I think we probably deserve a short break, but thank you all again for a fascinating and successful session.